Good evening and welcome. This is the uh, 1020 class meeting number four for May the 31st. And uh, let me return some papers here. Um, we want to um, we want to start right away by talking about some of the MLA issues. So get ready to write a few things down. One of the concerns that we have uh, is. Sorry, I'm taking roll here real quick. So, uh, one of the concerns that we have has to do with writing of these papers. Now, this is huge because this is a big part of the 1020 class. Now, the idea is you've done the 1010 class, and now you're ready to take the 1020 class. So, there's an assumption by the 1020 instructor that there's information that you learned in the 1010 class that you then use in the writing of the papers of the 1020 class. And I want to kind of review that real quickly to make sure that we kind of know what we're doing. There's kind of generally speaking two things that we have to be familiar with. The first is the form that we're writing with, the essay form. Now, the, the packet that I gave to you last time that was the NWCC 1010-1020 resource packet, Page number eight, that's the skeleton guide. And my assumption when you write a paper for me is that you are following that skeleton guide. So you want to pay particularly close attention to basic form. In its most simple language, the 1010-1020 paper is at least a five-paragraph presentation, where in the first paragraph we provide an introduction, we provide a, a thesis sentence that allows us to say what it is that we'll be working on. For example, for the last paper, our thesis sentence should have said something about a title from one of those texts listed and something about three messages because that was the assignment of the thesis. So that should be mentioned. Normally, our thesis is the last sentence of that first paragraph in the most simple way of presenting this five-paragraph essay. That After the intro paragraph, we have three at least body paragraphs that we call points of validation or ways we validate our thesis. For short, we call them POVs, points of validation. And the topic sentences of each of those three body paragraphs, normally the first sentence, will tell us what exactly is happening in that paragraph. So in its most simple, simple language, uh, the thesis sentence would say, there are three important messages in Shakespeare, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? And then in each one of the three body paragraphs, POV1, one message from, shall I compare these to, to a summer's day, is. A second message in the, second, in the third, a third message is, each one of those body paragraphs then treating that message. Do you got me? With a final fifth paragraph of conclusion, that basically kind of summarizes major thesis and uh, POVs, all right? And then occasionally do what we call extending beyond the thesis. So that's kind of the general framework. Again, page eight of the skeleton guide will kind of walk you through that. Now, for the 1020 class, within each one of those body paragraphs, we have two kinds of validation or quoting. We have what we call internal validation, and we have what we call external validation. Both these terms are mentioned on the Skeleton Guide, page 8. I just want to make sure that you understand what they mean. Internal validation, anytime we're quoting from the text we're working with. For example, Shakespeare, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? So if I'm quoting from, shall I compare these to a summer's day, I am doing internal validation. Let's say, for example, that one of the messages I believe from that poem is that Shakespeare argues that love is eternal as opposed to a summer's day, which is not. And then you use a quote from the actual poem, 
That we call again internal validation. I'm validating using lines from the actual text. And again, we're only stipulating in these early papers that you write from one of the assigned texts. Let's say, for example, that I were to require that you write from two of the assigned texts, then you would be writing more of a comparative analysis. For example, there are complementary messages, for example, between, shall I compare thee to a summer's day, and Wordsworth's uh, The World is Too Much With Us, two texts that we worked with from our last session, okay? So that would still be internal validation. I'm quoting from the text I am writing about. Okay? The second kind of validation we call external validation. External validation is when I go and I find other people, other than myself, who have written about the text. Okay? They're going to say something about Shakespeare's Shall I Compare Thee to a Summer's Day, or they're going to say something about Shakespeare, maybe. Okay? We call that external validation. Here, we are technically then citing our sources. C-I-T-I-N-G. Now, where you go to find this kind of information is what we mean by researching within the databases. Which is why, along with watching again or reviewing the tutorials on the Northwest College Library site, also in the packet that I gave to you, pages 1, 2, and 3 have to do specifically with online databases. By the way, if you run into any problems accessing those online databases, you want to go to the community library and ask the head librarian there. She will walk you through how to access those databases. If you don't have a library card, you're probably not going to be able to access those databases. You've got to have an actual library card, a PIN number from the library card, etc. Okay? Now, when you are citing, that is to say you are providing your information, the style book that we will be using, that's what we call it, the style book that we will be using is the Modern Language Association style book, the MLA style book. When we're studying within the humanities, this is the style book that we normally use. If we're studying in the sciences, we use what's called the APA style book, okay? Now, both of these style books, the MLA and the APA, again, information provided for you, both inside of your book, right? Those first 58 pages describe the MLA style book to some degree, okay? And in the packet that I gave to you with the sample essay on pages 9 through 14, 15, 16, that's also an example of the MLA style book. Now, here in terms of the style book, there are, again, two things, two places that we need to think about. First of all, there's what we call in-text citation. And second of all, there's what we call um, end notes. Okay? Or a works cited page. Got me? Now, let's just stick with, shall I compare thee to a summer's day, since we uh, were mentioning that as our text. And we are going to argue there are three important messages from Shakespeare's, shall I compare thee to a summer's day. One of those messages is, love is eternal, while a summer's day is not. It's very brief, okay? So we're working in our first point of validation, paragraph number two. Remember, paragraph number two, our first POV. And we say that Shakespeare's Shall I Compare Thee to a Summer's Day suggests that love is eternal while, or lasts a long time, while nature on a summer's day does not. And then I go to the databases and I find, let's say, Dr. Perez, who has written a paper on Shall I Compare Thee to a Summer's Day, okay? And it's published there. And Ms. Trimbath finds this paper and she wants to quote Mr. Perez in her paper. Now, there are two things that Ms. Trimbath has to know in the body of the paper. The first thing is she has to know Mr. Perez's name. Because in the body of the paper, we're going to need to provide that information of Mr. Perez's name. We give what's called proper attribution. To attribute means I have to tell where, Ms. Trimbath has to tell where she found the information. Okay? So when she gets ready to quote 
or to cite Mr. Perez, Ms. Trimbev has one of two ways to do this. One way to do this is a direct quote. Okay. Now, how will we know if we're looking at the paper that it is a direct quote? How will we know that? Because Ms. Trimbath will actually use quotation marks, right? She'll actually use quotation marks. In other words, let's say that Mr. Perez says that Shakespeare was really unsure about his views on love, okay? And then, in fact, maybe he wasn't so certain that love was eternal, which is why he wrote, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Notice the opening word of the poem is shall, which doesn't seem real sure. Like, I don't know, maybe you are better than a summer's day, but I'm not sure. Maybe love lasts, maybe, right? So this is his quote. One thing Ms. Tremeth can do is just quote it directly. We will know that she's quoting Mr. Perez directly because of quotation marks. Got me? That's not the only way, though, that she can quote. Another way that she can quote is what we call not a direct quote, but a secondary quote. And this is when we paraphrase, okay? When we paraphrase or give a brief summary of what Mr. Perez says. Let's say, for example, that Ms. Perez says, or Ms. Trembath <laughs> says, um, the uh, esteemed scholar, Mr. Perez, seems to suggest that Shakespeare is a bit convoluted in his views on love, and he kind of demonstrates that in his poem, Shall I Compare Thee to a Summer's Day. That's not an exact quote. That's not a word-for-word -word quote. So she's not going to put quotation marks around what she said about Mr. Perez's paper. But she is going to have to reference him. She has to cite. She has to say where it came from. They got me. Now, either way, we got to make sure that we've got the author's name Okay, mentioned in the body of the paper. Okay, you got to have the author's name. If, by the way, you don't do this, let's say Ms. Trimbath just quotes Mr. Perez without giving proper attribution, what do we call that? That's the famous P word. What's Plagiarism. that? Plagiarism. Bad, 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 as you learned in the 10 10 class. You don't want to do that. So, you got to provide the author's name. Why? Because there's the second part in the MLA style book. And that's the work cited page. So, for example, in your packet, if you've got it, look at it real quickly, page 15 and 16. Uh, if you've got your packet, just go to it real quickly. And there you go. That is a work cited page. Now, at the end of all of your papers, you must have a work cited page that looks like just like page 15, 16. Now, the MLA style book here will be able to help, you'll be helped by going to page 4 of your packet and creating a Noodle Tools account. Page four of your packet tells you how to create a Noodle Tools account. When you have a Noodle Tools account, you are able to immediately create this works cited page. Right. Now, let's make a couple of observations. Go back to page um, six, uh, 15 and 16 of your packet. Notice a couple of things right away. Do you see at the top of the page it says the actual words, works cited? Do you see it? You might want to circle it in red ink just to point out to yourself to remember to do that. Works cited. Notice we don't call this a bibliography. We call this works cited. In other words, anything that appears on that page is quoted in the body of the paper. Do you got me? So, for example, you can't miss, uh, Trimbeth couldn't list 14 articles that she found online about Shakespeare's Shall I Compare Thee to a Summer's Day, but she never actually quoted for them. Uh-uh. We, we call it a bibliography. She can't do that. What she has to do is list only on the works cited page what specifically she quoted in the body of her paper. Notice a couple of other things. Alphabetical order, last name first. Do you see it as you're looking on page 15? Alphabetical order, last name first. Do you notice the indention that occurs in each second and third line of an entry? Do you see that? So that the author's name kind of sticks out a little bit, and then do you see that it's double-spaced in between the entries to make it look clean? Do you see that? All of that, very important for us. Now, I understand that the majority of the research that you're doing is online which is why I've given you as well page 5, 6, and 7 of your packet to help you when you are quoting online sources, databases, and the like. Honestly, the most important thing, back up to my whiteboard, there's two really important things. First of all, we got to have the full name of the author. That is to say Mr. Perez's full name, to back to our example with Ms. Trebath. And then secondly, we have to be able to say where in terms of an article, an online source, whatever it is, we've got to know that information. In other words, it's very simple. 
You want to be able to give enough information in the body of the paper so that the prof can go to the works cited page and find where Ms. Trimbath found this information. Let's say, for example, that the prof's reading and, wow, that's a very interesting idea. I never really thought about that, Ms. Trimbath quoting Mr. Perez. I'm going to go find the same article and I'm going to spend a little time reading it myself. The prof needs enough information to be able to find Mr. Perez's article. Obviously, the name's got to be there. Obviously, a URL's got to be there for using an online source. Again, Noodle Tools will help you do this much more efficiently, quickly. Noodle Tools will actually ask you whether you want to use the MLA style book or the APA style book. And you actually will tell Noodle Tools this, so that way it will be clear. All right? So one of the first things that I will do when I pick up your paper is to go to the back page. How come? What's the last page? The works cited page, huh? What am I looking for there right away? What am I looking for? I'm looking for five entries. Five. Now notice these entries will not include Shakespeare, shall I compare thee to a summer's day. We don't put that on the works cited page. Why? That's internal validation. You're writing your paper on that text. And so you don't need to put that text on your works cited page, nor do you want to. It's understood in a 1020 paper. The paper is being written about, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? You're going to mention that in your intro paragraph. And that means for the rest of the paper, we understand that when you're quoting lines from a poem, you're most likely quoting lines from, shall I compare thee to a summer's day, right? right. That means on the last page, I should quickly be able to see five sources. All five of those sources need to have an author's name. If, for example, you go to Google and you do some search on a website and find a quote about Summer's Day, but there's no author's name associated with it, don't use it. Which is why we highly recommend that you stay away from strict Google searches for your information and you work through databases. Because why? Databases are going to provide you with author's names. Okay? So I should see five of those. So right away, for example, if I look at your paper and don't see five of these references, I immediately am looking at a paper that's not very high in terms of a score. The second thing I look for then is to scan your paper and I'm looking for quotes, direct or indirect, secondary, from the actual text that you are working with. Um, uh, I, I'm sorry, quotes from the text, as in, as in internal validation, and then quotes from right the other. Now to help us do this, and to make sure for the rest of our time together that we're doing this well, I'm going to recommend something. Along with your cover sheet that you're already doing, your cutting and your pasting, remember, of your thesis sentence and your three points of validation sentences. Remember, we're doing that on our cover page just to make sure that we're doing it correctly. Along with that work, I'm going to ask in the body of the paper, using red ink, Using red ink pen, I'll do this with red ink not to confuse you here, okay? In the body of the paper, there's your page right there, right? You got your little login information, you've got your two titles, correct? An academic title and then a creative title above it, right? Okay, go back to skeleton guide to make sure you understand I that. It's, on the left -hand side, you're... it's okay, I will allow right hand. Either way is fine. I will allow right hand or left hand. And now you've got your paper, you're writing, you're writing. Oh, I'm sorry, I should have done this with, blue, with black ink to start with. I apologize. You're writing, you're writing, you're writing, you're writing. There's your black, right? What I'm going to ask that you do in the left-hand margin, right? That's this margin right here. Every time you quote internal, that is to say from the text that you're writing about, I just want you to put an X mark there right next to it where it's being done in the left-hand margin. For internal? Right? Internal. In the right-hand margin, this is our external validation. Got me? Every time that you cite using the MLA style book, just put an X. Got me? Now, how many of these X marks on the right-hand margin should there be? Five. At least. Five. At least five. five. Correct? Why? Because on the reference right. page... The work cited page, yeah. you're going to have five. Make sense? Okay. This work is crucial to success in the 1020 class. Notice how you take a 1010 class to kind of learn how to do this, right? Now in the 1020 class, we do two big, really two, two major things. One, 
We read texts. We analyze those texts. What's the language we use? When we read those texts, what do we do? We annotate them. Right? Annotate them. Then the second thing we do is to respond to the literature by writing a paper. Correct? That paper, again, has to follow certain kinds of form in terms of just the way it looks on the page. That, again, back to your packet, should be pages 9 through 14. That's what your paper needs to look like, basically. And then pages 15, 16, you need to have a works cited page that looks just like that. Okay? That's the key, then, really to getting a good grade in 1020. Really, as long as you do two things for me, then I can give you a high grade. The first is, have annotations over the assigned readings. What's that tell me? If you, have a, if you have annotations done over all the readings, what's that tell me? You're doing the readings, correct? You're reading at the three levels of reading, remember? Right? Secondly, if you're writing these papers for me well, following the MLA style book, then I know that you are responding to the literature correctly, and hurrah, I can again give you a good score. Make sense? Right? So there we go, then, in terms of kind of a general okay, overview. I'm not handing this in yet. Right, see, some of you may decide to wait and hand in the paper to me when you're ready, right, when you're ready. Yeah, I just, yeah. Good. Let's now review meeting number four packets. Y'all be handing in two of them to me. Mr. Perez, I'm still waiting on your meeting three packet in your I formal paper now. number one. Good. So you'll hand it in at the end of the hour. Again, that's why we go with cover sheets to make sure we're good to go. Again, now I'm working with meeting number four. Make sure the date is on there, May 31st. Make sure it says 1020. Let's go over that now for tonight's meeting. You should be looking at your cover sheet now or writing on a sheet of paper, either one. The first will be your annotations of 720 to 894. Did I say that right? 750, I'm sorry, to 894. Those are the texts Madness, Ozymandias, Duchess, Eyes, Dover, Cool, Lover, Homer, Night, Death, Mask, and Acquainted. And again, you list each one of those on the cover sheet along with the page number from ARP. You then tell me whether that annotation is complete or incomplete. It's possible that some of those for you just can't get done. You run out of time, etc. But some points are better than no points. Does that make sense, what I just said? Some points are better than no points. So if you didn't get all of them done, at least maybe you got some of them done, and maybe a note at the bottom telling me why you were unable to get all of them finished. The second thing that you'll hand in to me tonight will be formal paper number three, right? Formal, uh, I'm sorry, formal paper number two. I apologize. Formal paper number two where you are working with one of those texts we just mentioned, again, three messages from the text, okay? All right. Any questions about any of the work of meeting number four? That's tonight's packet. All right, let's talk now about next week, meeting number five. This is the June 5 cover sheet. This is the June 5 cover sheet. And again, you'll have two submissions to me. The first will be the work of pages 909 to 1017. That will include the poems, and this will be our last session with poetry. We go very quickly through our semester, don't we? Yes. The uh, last treatments of poetry will be p piano, urn, proof rock, fish, wreck, birches, ice, Wall, arts, spring, marriage, drowning, astronomer, and lake. Okay? So those will be our those will be our poems for annotation. Got me? The second thing you'll hand in will be your formal paper number three. Your formal paper number three, just like formal paper number two must treat one of the poems from that session, the ones I just read off. However, we are not writing about three messages. We're not. We're going to change it now. And the assignment for formal paper number three will be to discuss from one of those poems the importance of figurative language. Figurative language. So you'll want to look back in art to the chapter on figurative language. 
Make sure that you understand what we mean by figurative language. Okay? Yeah, similes, metaphors. You got it. Similes, metaphors, personification. Now, here's the important thing. You might want to take a note or two here. You're not just going to write a paper where you give me examples, let's say from Keats's Ode on a Grecian Urn, page 917. Lots of figurative language in this poem. You're not simply going to write a paper where you show me three examples of figurative language from the poem. What you want to do is the following. You've got to answer two questions about figurative language. What is it and how does it work? What is it? Figurative language. For example, you could point out that there is a simile in Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, page 2, 9, uh, 925. That is true. So there is a simile in Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, okay, or a metaphor. I, he says in the poem, I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas, which means I should have been a crab. I wish I'd been born a crab at the bottom of the ocean. Now that's a metaphor. You can point out that Prufrock says that, and that is a metaphor. That is an example of figurative language. But you're only halfway done with that POV. You've got to explain the importance. How does it work? What's the importance of that? Okay. The second part will take up most of your points of validation time. Got me? It's fairly simple with the poems we're looking at to find examples of figurative language. It's more difficult to explain the importance of that figurative language, the significance of that figurative language. Does that make sense, what I just said? Okay. All right. So that one again, due on the fifth. So three points of validation. You got and it. And each point has to be what is it and how does it work. You basically. got it. Of an okay. of, of a example of figurative language. You got it. Okay. Now, just looking ahead to make sure that we all kind of know what's coming, we then finish by June the, I said, um, 28th. Right, our, our next meeting then will be June the 7th after that. Let's look ahead, right, meeting number six. You should be looking at your course outline now. Um, June the 7th is meeting number six, and that is a Thursday meeting. That's a week from today, correct? That's a week from today. Yeah. Um, and that's our meeting number six, okay? That will be the beginning of our work with plays or drama, okay? This is actually more of a viewing experience along with a reading experience. All right, and I don't have much more to say about this next week on Tuesday night, but I'm just kind of setting you up. For meeting number six, you're going to watch the play Othello in class, okay? With me, you'll actually watch it. The following session, number seven, you're going to watch the play Midsummer Night's Dream. And then finally, meeting number eight, so for three sessions, we'll be viewing, okay? You'll be watching the play Death of Salesman. Now, for each one of these plays, you'll have read them before you come to class and taken notes. Got me? So that when you come to class to watch the play, you already are familiar with what's going on in the play. You've read online plot summaries. You've read the play. You've done annotations over the different acts and scenes so that you know what's going on. So by the time you sit down, for example, on June the 7th to watch Othello, you already have a pretty good indication of what's going on. Now you'll begin to study the interpretation of the play, how the actors interpret the play, etc. All right? Then, by meeting, night, uh, by meeting 9 on June the 19th, we finish our semester by the study of some short stories. All right? And then we look at a series of short stories every session, meeting 9, meeting 10, and meeting 11. Right? That's our three meetings with short fiction. And then we finish with our final meeting, number 12, on June the 28th. And by that point, you want to have finished your novel, Lord of the Flies. So if you haven't picked up Lord of the Flies and reading the Lord of the Flies yet, I recommend that you're reading probably 15, 20 pages a day from here on out to get your Lord of the Flies started. All right? Okay. Questions about any of that? When we're doing these, we're still doing formal papers on each one of the plays. You're, uh, you're doing formal papers on, for example, meeting number six. You're going to write a comparative analysis between Othello and Trifles. 
Okay, so that's all you have to do. But with same format and everything. You the same got it. Everything okay. stays the same in regards to the MLA style book. Um, the meeting number seven, notice, no paper due. Do you see that? Oh, yeah. Idea. No paper due on meeting seven. <laughs> you'd like that. Right? Yeah, and you that is, is celebrating. <laughs> meeting number eight, however, oh, there, there is a paper. That one is death, re uh, death of salesman. Now, We'll, before we get there, I will outline the specific focus of the paper. Notice how, for example, I gave you specific foci for these other papers, for the first two, three messages, right. for the next and final paper over poetry, just dealing with figurative language. Remember how we remember uh, how I do that? I'll do the same thing in regards to these papers as well, so I can help you. Okay. All right? All right, so, All right, so we kind of have a, a clue what we're doing here. All right, well, with that in mind, then, let's spend our evening now working with several of our poems together. My assumption is that you have read the poems for tonight's reading and done your annotations. Is that a fair assumption? Yes, it is. Okay, so, for example, if I were to say, much madness is divinest sense to a discerning eye, would you understand that that's a poem of this evening's uh, work? Yes. Right? So let's go through them. You might want to look at your cover sheet real quickly. Tonight, I'd like to comment briefly on the following poems. I can't treat all of them, obviously. I don't have the time. But I'd like to work with the following poems. Madness, page 750. Ozzy, page 758. Duchess, 768. Dover, 813. Lover, 857 and Homer 884. So I'm going to work with each one of those real quickly to kind of give you some ideas. So you definitely want your annotations out for each one of those. All right, and again, I'll list them as I go through them. And then you're taking in-class notes over those annotations, right? Now, where are your in-class notes? On which side of the line? Right. On the right-hand side of the line with what color ink? Blue. You're working with blue or black ink. Good, that's right. So uh, when I look at your packets, I'll be looking specifically at these annotations, right, yes. to make sure that you've kind of got some sense of what's going on. Now, if you don't have the annotations quite finished, then just take out blank sheets of paper, follow our discussion, um, take your notes on the right-hand side of the line, and then go back and do, do your own annotations on the left-hand side of the line. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. So let's open our hymnals real quickly to 750. And we're just going to work through these now real quickly. And uh, we um, hope that uh, Lorena and Mr. Haynes are able to join us by video. And we would obviously m want to uh, wish Mr. Haynes the best uh, in, his, uh, in his recent um, tragedy. Mr. Haynes, we hope that you get better and that you join us quickly. Let's begin, first of all, with Much Madness is Divinest Sense, Emily Dickinson. I apologize we don't have more time to spend with Emily Dickinson. We should be, I, it's unfortunate, we, I, I would love to be able to spend an entire evening just talking about this very experimental author. To show you how important she is, by the way, open to the cover of your book, Art, and notice that there are a few poets that Art gives special kind of treatment to by providing a large number of their poems. Do you see who the first one is that's a featured poet? Emily Dickinson. I'm, I'm working on the actual cover, Ms. Trimbath. The very okay. cover itself, the very first yeah. one is Emily Dickinson. Notice that she has probably more poems in this volume than any other single writer, which says what about what Art thinks about this poet? She's a gun, right? Yeah, she's obviously a gun. So it's very unfortunate that I don't get to spend more time working with Miss Dickinson's poetry, but let's at least look at one of her poems. Let's point out a couple of things right away. First of all, let's say that the work of Emily Dickinson is almost always very short, brief poems. She's very experimental in her poetic uh, form. Notice just looking at the poem on the page, on page 750, how many dashes there are at the end of each one of many of those lines. Do you see that? She's going to use very simple language, but by the time you finish reading one of her poems,